Hello, I'm Jim Jenkins from Applied Technology Institute. I'm the founder and president of the company. Wanted to introduce you to some video samples from our courses. These video samples are the instructors who actually teach the course, giving you a brief description of what the course is intended to cover, what's unique about the course, and then you actually get to see them present five or six slides as part of the course to get a feel for the level. My name is Bruce Elbert and I teach a number of courses for ATI in Satellite Communications Engineering. The course I'm about to give a brief introduction to and give a small part of is Satellite Communications Payload Design and System Architecture. So we're going to start out by taking a look at the block diagram of a typical satellite communications repeater uh, of the type that in this course we take apart and look in detail. And this is called a bent pipe repeater. We also describe and discuss the digital processing type of repeater and multi-beam antennas. But this repeater has all of the elements in it that I would cover in detail. So first of all, the input side to a bent pipe repeater is a wideband receiver, which you see illustrated here. This particular device is the, is the low noise front end which has four stages of gallium arsenide field effect transistor amplification. It has a temperature compensation to keep the gain uh, constant through that device. And the final stage is the one that is potentially going to introduce intermodulation distortion, which has to be held to a low level. The next diagram shows the down, the down converter section of the wideband receiver on a satellite on a bedpipe satellite, and the input is amplified and then translated from the uplink frequency band to the downlink frequency band in a down converter, which is done in a step recovery diode, or SRD. Feeding into it is the local oscillator, which is at a frequency of 5.6 gigahertz, the frequency that is subtracted from the uplink frequency to give the downlink frequency. And that local oscillator is derived from a 140 megahertz crystal oscillator, that is in an oven to maintain its temperature and hence its frequency as stable as possible. That 140 megahertz is multiplied first by 5 and then by 8, or a total of 40, to produce the 5.6 gigahertz. And there is amplification and bandpass filtering to limit the carrier that comes through to just the one frequency we want. And over here is a notch filter to remove a frequency that could produce a spurious frequency in the output of the receiver. Following the receiver uh, is usually a bank of filters which are used to separate the transponders. The typical transponder bandwidth is 36 megahertz. And this input filter consists of a waveguide filter that actually filters down to 36 megahertz bandwidth at some frequency. And there's also a delay equalizer to produce uh, flat uh, delay versus frequency which we call group delay distortion. So this is a, a snapshot of a portion of the overall car course that lasts three days that delves into every part of the, of the satellite communication payload, which includes the antenna system and the repeater and its electronics, and also addresses how this would fit in an overall satellite communication network. My name is Bruce Elbert, and I'm teaching a course titled Earth Station Design, Operation, and Maintenance, and I'm going to present a small portion of that course as a sample of the content that is really covered over a four-day period. This first slide shows three large antennas used at a ground station located in California. And they are examples of the types of antennas we find at a major facility, such as a teleport or a gateway station. So we have a large 30-meter antenna, which is of the type that was installed in the, in the 1970s for the Intelsat system. And over time, sizes have decreased down to one as small as 9 meters, illustrated here at the same site, also used to communicate over the, the Pacific Ocean, as well as another 9 meter antenna illustrated here. So a portion of the course deals into the technology and design of antennas, the selection of the proper antenna. And I want to convey an understanding of the technical principles behind the operation of an antenna so that you'll see how that eventually fits in an overall system. So first of all, we have to understand that 
a reflector type of antenna has a feed horn or some type of feed arrangement. This is called a primary feed horn. And it radiates towards the reflector and produces some distribution of electromagnetic energy at the right frequency across the reflector. And that in turn uh, reestablishes the far field, in the far field, a, a narrow beam. But to, to get to that point, the energy is first converted from electromagnetic waves into electrical currents flowing in the surface of the reflector. And you'll notice that these go along a curved line so that when the energy is re-radiated, it no longer has the pure polarization that existed from the feed horn, which in this case is supposed to be vertical. However, at some distance from the antenna, because of the symmetry of this antenna, the horizontal components cancel out, and what's left is only the vertical component. Now let's take a look at the antenna pattern that's produced, looking at both the copolarized, which is the vertical polarization in the last diagram, versus the cross-polarized, which would be any undesired horizontal polarization that manages to be radiated. So we see in the upper part a typical type of cut through that pattern presented with the main beam and the side loops, which would be taken horizontally, let's say, like my hand is. And that preserves the total symmetry of that re-radiation that I just described. And you see a well-defined main beam and then side lobes which fall off in the same polarization the way we would expect to see them. The cross-polarized energy from this, satellite, from this antenna is essentially zero due to the symmetry, the cancellation that, that I described in the last slide. So we have what is really an ideal situation. Now, if we were to make the cut diagonally, what would happen is, because of the orientation of this cut, we still have the same main lobe and side lobes of the desired polarization, but the cross pole now, while zero at the center, has a side lobe pattern more or less matching the copole pattern. So we lose our isolation in the side lobe region. We only have it at the center of the main beam. Now in reality, we will not have a zero cross pole situation like in the perfect case above, but due to struts and other um, aberrations or, or characteristics of a real physical antenna, there will be side lobes that are cross-polarized. I mentioned about how the feed horn illuminates the main reflector, and there are trade-offs in how that illumination is accomplished. If we had the, the basic, most perfect type of, of illumination, that would be what we call uniform which is illustrated by this uh, square wave right here. This is illumination by the feed horn of the reflector, which is constant until it reaches the edges and drops to zero. Of course, this is impossible to obtain in practice. But if we were to obtain that, we would have a gain factor of one, meaning we would have 100% power that will be transmitted. So that's the good news. But we will have a first side lobe that is only about 13 dB down. And that's because the far field pattern is the Fourier transform of the uh, primary pattern from the feed horn. That produces the side lobe that's 13 dB down. Now, if that illumination is tapered, is rounded at the edges, in fact, drops to zero at the edges in a smooth way, we see that the side lobe drops with each step of how that taper is accomplished. In the best case here at the bottom, which is like a Gaussian shape illumination, which is typical, the side lobe now is 32 dB down, giving very good performance in terms of uh, adjacent satellite projection. But our efficiency factor drops to 67%. So that gives you an idea of the trade-off of the two. So this is uh, a small part of the overall course on ground segment. Obviously, I have to address everything else in the Earth station, which I do in detail and then show how the Earth Station fits in an overall satellite network.